Good evening. Tonight, we're going to look at Prometheus and the serpent or the Genesis. Two traditions, and I keep coming back to the point in my own reflection that I don't think either of them have been understood. Let's see if we can make that point. First, there is a basic fundamental problem, and that is when we look at the Genesis story of the serpent, called the Garden of Eden story. Are we dealing with a legend or a myth? Now, a myth classically can be easily defined. At least one figure must be divine or parents divine. There has to be a setting And there has to be a set of qualities describing the figures. <clears throat> Setting is very important. There has to be a setting, a set. There has to be a set of qualities or characteristics essential to the story. There has to be a purpose. There has to be a purpose to a myth. It must have an end, a goal, a purpose. It must illuminate something. And insofar it is, is a myth, there must be to it a drama. Now these are the five classic elements of a myth. Well, we have them here. Figure the Genesis, divine, a setting, Garden of Eden, <clears throat> characteristics assigned to each, certainly a drama, this is where we're going to have some interesting reflection, purpose, goal. Now, the difficulty of getting into the Garden of Eden story with the serpent is that it is so overlaid with interpretation that you have to decide whether you want to deal with the interpretation or the tale itself. That's a fundamental point. I choose to ignore the interpretation and stay with the tale itself. If we stay with the tale itself, then we can do something and see something quite interesting. And I want to propose it to you. Of course, as you know, Adam and Eve are created in the garden not created, made. Not created, made out of the dirt, out of the dust, out of which God molded them. That's actually the second creation, because the first creation, as you recall, is on the sixth day when God created man and woman. So this, this story, the Garden of Eden story, starts on the seventh day of what is commonly called creation. So he made man, Adam, and Eve. Now, as you know the story, there was a beautiful tree in the garden, and it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, God said to them, God said to them, they can eat of every tree in the garden except of this one. There's another tree in the garden that therefore they were open to eating. And that's the tree of life. No prohibition against it. Furthermore, in the days of creation when God creates plant life, 
He says, and I, and I created plants and seeds. And no prohibition. You can eat anything you want. And he told them, of course, in the sixth day, Adam and Eve, to be fruitful and multiply and to have domain over all of that land. And he is to have domain over the fish, the sea, the birds, every living thing that moves, every plant yielding seed. every green plant, no prohibitions. It's only on the seventh day that this is prohibited. As you know then, there's the great tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and enter the serpent. Ah, the serpent. If we were to take this story and treat it systematically, we would then list all of the characters, right? God, Adam, I'll put them in a row. Adam, Eve, serpent. And we could construct a table. Everything any of them says or any, rec any reference made to them that has any predictive quality to it, that is, if God says something about the future, we can see whether or not that future event takes place or not. So we can set up a table here to judge to what degree they are able to accurately describe, accurately describe the present and the future in terms of the story. If we do that and follow the story, we will find that the one figure in the story that consistently tells the, the truth is the serpent. We will find that as we go through it, that God does not. This is a very curious story. I want to go back to that in a few moments. The serpent then tells Adam and Eve about, or Eve at first, as you know. He said, uh, did God say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, God didn't say, lest you touch it, so she went overboard a bit, and therefore we can mark her short of that truthful statement. But the serpent said to the woman, you won't die, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of, the, of, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, to light to the eyes, the tree was be desired to make one wise, she took it, ate, gave some to her husband, he ate it, their eyes were both opened, check. And they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves. Now, God told them not to eat of it. That's the crime. Take them before the tree. And now the judgment. Now, <clears throat> as it is often described, what happened? What happened? Well, God banished only Adam, not Eve. Eve remained in the garden. She is not described as being banished. And Adam, in fact, is not banished anywhere. 
just out of the garden. He stays in Eden because, according to God, Adam returns to the ground from which he was taken, a holy place, the point of creation, or the making, since it came out of the dust, the dirt. So therefore, look what we're saying now. We're saying that Adam and Eve were not banished. Adam was exiled from the garden, but he was not banished from Eden. The garden was just in the east of Eden. Adam was actually returned back to that place from which he was taken. Now, why were why was why why was Adam then exiled from the garden? What is the reason? Now, when I ask for the reason, I want to know the reason in terms of what God said. I want to get it from the text. I want to know why did God exile or uh, remove him or, or uh, we could say banish. I think that would be a better word than exile. Banish. Banish Adam from the garden. What does God say about it? Well, the Lord God said, Behold, the man, now watch the use of the masculine throughout this entire account. Behold, the man has become like one of us, just as the serpent said. You become like God. Knowing good and evil. That's what the serpent said. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He sent him back to the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim with a flaming sword to keep the, which turned everywhere to guard the way to the tree of life. Now let me go back over it. According to the story, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of evil to till the ground from which he was taken. So he moved him from the garden of Eden over to another place that was equally to be tended. Another garden, another place of t uh, being taken care of. Why did God do that? Because... Now that he is, his eyes are open, he may now reach forth and take from the tree of life and live forever. So therefore, Adam became like the God. And why did God then banish him? He didn't want him to take that next step and live forever, and there would be no difference. Here, he's like him in respect to, to the good and evil. Therefore, the serpent's account was absolutely accurate. So if we were to work through the whole story, which you can do, it takes probably no more than a half an hour to go through it carefully, you can then establish a table and see who is most accurate, who is least. And, and hey, you can put Adam and Eve in there too, and you can see exactly what's going on in the story. It's a very consistent story. Now, in order to have a myth, you have to discover the purpose. Right? It has to have a purpose. You have to also be able to express a myth analogically, because that's the way you unpack a myth. You have to then take it analogically to see what's going on. What would be difficult about taking this story analogically? Well, first of all, what kind of a God then is this? It's a curious God because it's more than one. 
Behold, the man has become like one of us, plural, not singular. There's polytheism here. Us. I am not going to any interpretation, no interpretation. I want to take the tale itself. If I take the tale itself, I can make these points with it. Now, that means then the serpent was a clear seeing one. When God, God said, on the very day you eat of the tree, you'll die, he didn't die. God was wrong. The serpent was right. If, if we had a story where someone was doing that, would you not agree we'd have to put names on what kind of a being it is that is not telling the truth, doesn't want man to become like him most fully, banishes him to the very place that he came from. You see, if we think for a moment, what kind of a place is that? That has to be a holy place because that's from the place from which man was made. In what way is it a punishment then? Eve wasn't sent out, only Adam. Therefore, though it may be surprising to feminists, Eve was still in the garden. Now, a loving God, a God that's caring for man, interested in his development, trying to concern himself for the growth and the development and nurture of man? No. No, he kept, from, kept him from the knowledge of good and evil. Kept him ignorant in that respect, or innocent if you prefer. And put him in a place where right in the middle of the garden there is this temptation, right in the middle of it. He could have reached for the tree of life, didn't only awoke to its possibility after he woke up. So now if we put all these images together, what name shall we give for this kind of a deity in the story of the Garden of Eden? Jealous? That's difficult to say because man hasn't reached the status where he would be jealous of man. But certainly someone who wanted to curtail any further growth and development he certainly didn't want any, any other kind of thing to become like us. So therefore, he doesn't want man to become part of that eternal. Therefore, it's extremely difficult to reach now for the purpose. It's not transparent at all, the purpose of the story. Man isn't benefited. He's, or he has benefited by obeying the serpent and not God. If benefit means he's developed further, he's now seeing, he now has the knowledge of good and evil. Curious story. Because of that curiosity, I would like to move to the next story. Prometheus. So let me take this one off and start with Prometheus now. Now, you see, we have two traditions, or sometimes we say we have two traditions, one Judeo-Christian and the other Greek or classic. But I wonder whether we're taught both, one by one, side by side. I wonder why we're never taught them both together, literally, the story itself. I wonder why that is. Curious thing. No. Prometheus is not a god. He's a titan. A titan. And <clears throat> very, very similar features are going to occur here. This titan makes man out of clay. And Athena comes and breathes life into him, and therefore man now becomes active. Because of that original 
connection with man, Prometheus has an interest in man. Now Zeus was not in any way favored by this creation. Again, a making, same as in the Genesis, out of clay, out of dirt. And therefore, according to the story, three times twice, three times altogether in the story, twice before man is nearly totally extinct, comes close to the extinction twice. Zeus is totally indifferent to man. And as a matter of fact, uh, there are a few lines in the uh, Aeschylus' play where he thinks man is a very punny thing without any significance. Prometheus, then, wants to save man. And Zeus kept man from gaining control of fire. That's what he provided. He kept man from fire. So Prometheus thought and said, you know, if we can give man power over the fire, then there may be a chance for a man to survive. And so, as you know in the story, he went up to the heavens and he went to Hephaestus and he brought back the flames from Hephaestus's uh, foundry and brought it down in a funnel and then gave it to man and that's how he gained fire. As a consequence then, with the control of fire, man survived. But there's more to the story, and that's what I would like to enter into now. Look, Prometheus, now I'm going to talk about Prometheus. There are different sources of Prometheus. There's Aeschylus and there's Hesiod. And I'm going to now refer at this point to Aeschylus, who wrote this great play, a trilogy of which only one part survives. Now, Aeschylus says that Prometheus not only brought fire, he brought the arts. He brought language. He, brought, he gave man the ability and the power to gain control of his mind. He gave man not only the arts, but taught him how to domesticate animals. Right to control and to breed animals. And therefore, what he did is he gave him a tool to assist him, help him, free him from labor. It's because of this gift that man survives, not merely on a low level, but rather than can then create with the arts especially the greatest one in the classic world, medicine. Now, one of the quotes from Aeschylus is, once they were fools, I gave them the power to think, and through me they won their they won their minds because he gave them language, you see. The power to think. So here we have something interesting, similar. Like here over there is the tree of the knowledge good and evil. Here's there's a knowledge too. This is a knowledge, a powerful tool. It's not good and evil. He did not give man morality. Well, we're not clear whether Adam and Eve got morality. They learned what was good and bad, or good and evil. But for this story, Prometheus, they're given all of this, but explicitly no insight into good and evil. Now, um, Prometheus then did one other thing which has a very great significance in the whole tradition of Greek thought and classic thought. He taught man how to sacrifice. Now, Zeus wanted man to sacrifice and there was some discussion in the heavens about what is a proper sacrifice and how should it be performed. And Prometheus was called upon 
to play a role in deciding this issue. So Prometheus came up with a very interesting scheme. And what he did was to show man how to wrap the flesh and fat and the long thigh bone for the altar fire in honor of the gods. But what he did, as you know, is that he taught man to take the best cuts of meat and put them in one place here and on the inedibles on this side, covered that with a hide and covered it also with fat. He put these good cuts of meat in the stomach and smeared it so it looked like it was all things to be discarded. And Prometheus then called Zeus to pick which one he wanted that should be proper for a man to sacrifice. And of course, Zeus picked what appeared to be the best. And of course, he was furious when he discovered that he picked the wrong one, that this is the real one. Ah, then Prometheus then taught man how to sacrifice. And from that point on, what we have is a tradition where the Greeks would sacrifice and therefore they would always sacrifice the long thigh bone and, and that which is inedible. And they would keep all the meat for themselves and have a banquet and have a feast. He taught mankind tax evasion. Pardon? He taught mankind tax evasion. Tax evasion. <laughs> he, that's what he taught him, didn't he? I also see uh, there's a correlation between the Prometheus story and what he gave man and the story in the Enoch of the Watcher Angels who gave those same gifts to mankind but was were thoroughly uh, uh, contaminated by mankind. Oh, oh, see this is not. Now, so what we have here, of course, is that when Zeus discovered what Prometheus did for man and this event, he then, of course, chained him to that mountain in the Caucasus and he had to stay there for 40,000 years. Each night, uh, eagle would come down and claw away and eat away at his liver and then he'd have to spend the next day recovering and, and suffering and then each night the same event would go on and on. Therefore, Prometheus a demigod is the one who is punished, not man, not man. Man receives the benefit, receives the benefit of a god who acts, a demigod who acts in his favor. A god who is interested in his development and his growth and the development of his mind through the arts. And he's interested in, in uh, the arts, especially of medicine. Now, we can contrast these two stories. Because as we consider the Garden of Eden story, later, of course, Adam and Eve are said to now to descend to earth in a way in which isn't specified in the story. And then they have to take on that tradition. And the tradition is then that they are responsible and they are being punished for something that benefited them. Well, because it must have benefited them because they became like God. They learned something. Their eyes were open. They learned good and evil. The knowledge of it. But in what way were they punished? Was Adam punished? He was sent to work in the very fields from which he was created. Eve stayed in the garden. See, it's only a punishment if we use the traditional way of understanding the story, the interpretation of it. The story itself it does not admit of any serious punishment whatsoever. Here we have a punishment. 
because Prometheus is chained to the, to the mountain and uh, therefore he has to suffer that injustice and that punishment of the eagles eating away at his liver each night. Now, both traditions are in our culture. And now we're looking at them together. We're looking at them together. And now we have to ask ourselves, what a curious way of teaching man about his origin. Both come out of clay. God breathed the life into Adam and Eve. And Athena breathes life into the clay figures. Similar. There's a figure that helps man in both. Zeus and God are, in that in one sense, very similar because the God of the Old Testament doesn't have man's good at, his, in, at, at the forefront of his mind. He doesn't bring about this transition that Prometheus was able to bring about. The serpent helps man. Prometheus helps man. I have a... Oh. Pardon me? When was the Old Testament dated? Was the date on it? There's a lot of arguments about it, but there are two, there are two, literally according to scholars, there are two creation myths. The seven day creation is one story and the Garden of Eden is another creation story. They are different. And it was said that they were crafted some, somewhat at the time during the Babylonian captivity, which is somewhere around 600, 5, 560 BC in that period. And uh, because it has very great many similarities between the creation story and the Ilagimash story of the Babylonians. Um, now Prometheus now is chained and he's suffering this punishment and he says look at me then in chains a god who failed the enemy of Zeus whom all gods hate all that go in and out of Zeus's hall the reason is that I loved men too well But, in, but silence is intolerable here. There he is suffering on the mountain in the, Gorgia, in the uh, uh, Caucasus Mountains. But silence is intolerable here. So too is speech. I am fast bound, but I must endure. I gave to mortals gifts. To speak is pain, but silence too is pain. Zeus, who came from the gods later than the Titans, mm -hmm. acquired so much power. When it was stand yeah. the reason that the Titans, who were older, yeah. should have been wiser, more experienced, That's right. That's right. and therefore developed more power. Yes. The Titans tried to storm heaven, and there was a furious battle, and they lost the battle. Well, Zeus killed us too. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes. Power. That's true. Yeah. And freed his mm -hmm. direct uh, brothers and sisters and banished his other half brothers. And That's right. And his brother being Epimetheus. Yeah. 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 And Pardon. Prometheus is forethought, as you know, right? Methus is thought. Prometheus, forethought. Well, that kind of runs parallel to the. To the story of the battle in heaven between the angels. They are part. They, that is there. Their battle in heaven. The battle in heaven. They also were one set of angels. The watchers were another set of angels that were sent down. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a few parallels in all of them. Also, when Prometheus was punished by being chained, and uh, the serpent, whether it was Satan or uh, uh, Leviathan, was punished by having. Uh, 
His legs taken and was forever crawled upon his belly. Yes, but um, so there are between yeah, there is a punishment there, but they're somewhat different. But they're just kind of like parallel, not exact. Oh yes, 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 the same features in both, and the difference is what man receives, and what man is denied. There's several other like the the uh -huh. Gnostic version of the Garden of Eden is totally different than the standard uh, Judeo-Christian. Oh, the, the, there's a, there's, in the ancient times, the serpent was the sign of wisdom, and he was seen as the more of the more godly, and the mm -hmm. creator was the more of the trickster tradition. Um, just one, one more. Um. Uh, Prometheus strikes a, a, a very interesting keynote in of the whole tragedy. His knowledge of the future, of course, turns out to be his redemption. And yet, and yet, all tortured though I am, fast fettered here, he, Zeus, shall have need of me, the Lord of heaven. So he knows, even though through all the punishment, at some point in the future, he is going to win, he's going to be released. Um, and just to give a couple of lines on the gifts and how the creatures of a day and now the creatures of a day have flaming fire yes and learn many crafts therefrom for deeds like these Zeus holds you guilty Prometheus and tortures me with never ease from pain. Is no end then to your tortures set before you? No, none. None other except when it pleases him. Chains bind my feet fast. Advice is easy for the fortunate. All that has come I knew full well. Of my own will I shot the arrow that fell short of my own will. Nothing do I deny. I helped man and found trouble for myself. I knew, and yet not all. I did not think to waste away, hung high in the air upon a lonely rock. But now I pray you, no more pity for what I suffer here, come, leave your car and learn the fate that steals upon me. And of course, Lo comes in and, and is able to get him off the rock. Now, how can we use these stories, either one, because it's quite simple to use Prometheus. We can focus on this. We can focus on the development. How can we do it with the Garden of Eden? How can we, do it? we have two traditions. One, where man is punished for, for a crime, which in reflection seems hardly a crime, except for one thing, he, they did consciously disobey. But the reason God uh, exiles Adam is not because he disobeyed, because he was worried about be him becoming the same as God himself. So you can't make a myth out of it. You can't make a myth out of the Garden of Eden story because you have to first discover its purpose. What's the purpose? Let's, can we save it? Can you find a purpose that justifies the Garden of Eden story as it is? Maybe. What would you say? That it's, uh, well, it's, it serves as a, uh, a place where uh, the development occurs. The first first phase of, of development. 
occurs. Man has the awareness. Eve is, they're, they're actuated. And that development must be That's against a divine force, though. Right. So he's usurping the power of God. Yes. Now, can we do that? Well, I, I, I think, I think it, it goes even further. Go ahead. Uh, than usurping the power on her. Because uh, uh, he's the, he could become a younger God with more vitality. Who, who, pardon me, who's the he? Man. Man. Man, because you have the Titan who is older, okay, and Zeus represents a group of gods who are later gods that acquire more power. So Zeus may not only fear him for becoming his equal, but perhaps becoming greater. Well, certainly um, in the Prometheus story, all of the elements for development, especially development of the mind, are there. I, I certainly agree with you there. Uh, but what purpose then can we assign for the Old Testament? Can we say then that man then must recognize that he has no friend in heaven? Here, at least when Prometheus is freed, he returns to the heavens. He has an ally in heaven. Now what makes this more curious, of course, you know, later as the story of Jesus comes, he calls, and he is called the second Adam. It's called the second Adam. Well, um, now, what is, what is the significance of Adam? Adam went back from the place from which he was taken to till the ground, exactly what he was doing in the garden. Here, with the Promethean story, Prometheus specifically gives man animals to, for domestication so that then they can release him from work. Now, if you have a Certainly we have a drama. We have characteristics of each of the people in the story as well as the characteristics of each of the figures. We have a divine being. We have a situation. To take a myth, to take a myth which is essentially a drama, you then must find the characters in it, see how they function, what they do, Find the particular drama in it, I'll call that uh, D, and then you have to find something analogous to it, A prime, one, two, three, B prime, one, two, three, C prime, one, two, three, and something analogous. In order to do that, to set this up, we have to discover the purpose of it. Certainly with Prometheus, we have a purpose that's very clear. Man was going extinct for the third and perhaps last time. Prometheus came and saved man, saved the human race, and gave him the arts and the, and the means for which he could then continue his existence on a high level, brought into existence the arts, language, for the training of the mind. Oh, that's quite simple to do. We can understand that. What's the purpose now for the Old Testament? What purpose would you put for that last saying? I think one of the problems could be in the, the Greek. There's a beginning, middle, and end of the story. Beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. but, but the Old Testament, so many parts of it have been taken out, have been added, that uh, it seems, seems like there's part of the story missing. That is. Such as, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, the Jewish apocryphal stories in which Eve was Adam's second wife. Lilith was his first, who yes. was the father yes. of, who was yes. the mother of Cain. If that is part mm -hmm. of the story, That's true. then 
give Adam mm -hmm. the tree of life, mm -hmm. he could continue the human race with two women instead of just the one who's kept within the garden. In which case, the human race would be an infinitely intelligent and immortal uh, of, uh, a race. Yes, we could say then that the Garden of Eden story is a fragment that needs additional pieces to complete it. And as it is, it's a fragment. And that's why you can't make sense of it. Or you have to conclude in a very strange way that there is a polytheism, many gods, and these gods have nothing in... Uh, or, not, pardon me, not that they don't have anything, but they have a very clear opposition to man becoming any more like God than they have, and they became like him by disobeying him. Well, that's the end of that. So you, you can't do anything with that. You can't uplift it. It's not uplifting. It has no morale. It has no moral. also could be a problem with translations, too. Well, the, all of the translations in respect to this story are the same. I went through, you know, well, I've gone through all the translations. Where after Cain slew Abel, he was sent to the land of Nod, somewhere to the east of Eden. Nod is, uh, just means, in ancient uh, Hebrew, the land with no name. It's not an actual noun. It's not a proper noun. It's just the wasteland, somewhere that doesn't have a name. But okay. so many of the, the translations make it sound like it's an actual place. Is there, once we allow interpretation, then there isn't any difficulty. If we say it's a common use of the word us and it wasn't meant literally, well, then it's open. But, but if we don't interpret and just stay with the story, I think the only conclusion is that it's either a fragment or it's a very strange story to be the foundation for a culture that in no way advances man and no longer in any way it makes him akin to his own mind because in the Prometheus legend, obviously, man and mind become very close. Here, the very idea of being able to reach the knowledge of good and evil was through a theft. You're a crook, you're a thief. And then you're punished for doing it. And punished for doing it. You go back to the labor. Yeah. You don't get to use it. Yeah. And uh, we could go further and we can say in both stories, by the way, um, uh, maybe perhaps take a minute out and do this. Um, in the seven days of creation, there's an original opening statement, you know, where God said he created uh, heaven and earth. But then the succeeding sections, accounting for each of the days, there is only creation in two places, on the fifth day and on the sixth day. Because on the fifth day, God is said to have created great whales, great sea monsters, whales, and Adam and Eve, uh, not Adam and Eve, man and woman. All the rest, the expression is, and uh, let. Each time that word, like, if I let this drop, I'm not creating anything, I'm just letting it be. So as we go through the account, therefore, um, God said, let there be a firmament in, in the midst of the waters. God said, let there be light, let there be, means, of course, that there must have been something there, let there be, is not a creation. It's an allowing a condition to emerge. And therefore, let there be light, and there was light. Right? Let there be a partition, a partition of the waters. There's a certain structure that repeats itself through this entire thing. And in that respect, the, in, in, the, in a very real sense, this is not a creation story. The universe isn't created. It evolves. It must, must have evolved. But let it be. And therefore, it brings you back to what does that opening statement mean? It isn't consistent with this. You have a problem here 
that it looks like the story, the creation story, the first couple of lines is itself a fragment, not connected with the whole. This account to the first six days, to the beginning of the seventh day, is a sequence. The Garden of Eden story starts where then God makes man again. He did it on the sixth day. Now he's doing it on the seventh day. Clearly, they're two different stories. They're two different accounts. You can't put them together. It's not a consistent whole. Well, that's all right. That's a tradition. And perhaps it should be taught as traditions that these are stories, a collection of stories. And while we put one next to the other, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were made that way. Otherwise, we have internal difficulties dealing with the whole thing. Um, let me just give that one line here so we can take a good look at it. Um, see, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And all the others, he let be, he let there be. And then in the garden, um, the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So there's two separate, uh, this is a making, the Genesis, the original Genesis account. Let's take the first chapter as if it were the original account. This story there is a creation. In the Garden of Eden, it's made, very much like in the Promethean legend, made out of clay, made out of the dirt. So therefore, I'm going back and say that it's a legend. It's a fragment. It's not a myth yet, unless you get some additional piece so that we can relate it into a structure of a myth. If you allow no interpretation, then you have all of these difficulties. You have two parts that don't fit together, first, second chapters. In the Greek world, what makes a big difference is that the Greek world had legends. Now what makes this so different is that a great artist came along by the name of Aeschylus, a great tragedian, and he took that myth or that legend and he wove it together into an artful production. That's what's missing in the first part, a level of mindfulness. So when Aeschylus took that story, he could fashion it and he could mold it because we can compare his account and Hesiod's account. We can see that Aeschylus is much more significant. It has much more internal meaning. All of the parts fit together as a work of art. Therefore, we have two interesting parts in our culture. One that needs more and more work to bring it together. In one sense, what I think what's going on in our age is that more and more people are seeing a need to have a new canon. Right? A new canon. We are getting to the place now with the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi text and the discovery of ancient writings, that maybe we have to put together a new canon with all of the parts put together, surface them all, and see if we can build them. And where there are gaps, let's find our most creative people to make an artful whole of the whole thing. If it cannot be, then at least we have on the other side a Greek world where it already exists as an artful form. And those two are going to be at variance with one another and competing with one another. And it's going to be a very interesting period that I think we're going to live through. So let us continue our discussion and come on to light. Don't want to stop it at this point. So let me invite you to participate. Well, if there were two creations of two sets of humans, then the part where Cain was expelled from Eden would make sense because he was given the mark of Cain, so no woman would mate with him. 
that wouldn't make sense unless there was another group of humans on the face of the earth somewhere. Well, yes, you see, another part of the story which, which makes sense, you see, when God in the uh, Garden of Eden tells Eve that she will give birth and when she does so she'll, she will be in pain and travail, but actually in the next chapter God is the first midwife because he assists Eve in, in coming to birth, bringing to birth. So, you know, it doesn't fit. You need, there's something missing. You need something else in there. Or the stories in fragments. I prefer a re-examination, re bringing all of this material together. There's great work out there now, including the Gospel of Thomas and Q, and a lot of very great things that are coming to birth. And if we can bring them all together and say, look, let's have it all open. Of course, that may uh, bring a new class of divinity students into existence, and perhaps that would be benefit to everyone. Perhaps the, uh, the old Hindu uh, legends, uh, from their aspects, would uh, present pieces that, uh, that, that are missing from uh, uh, the Judeo uh, and Greek That's uh, culture by, by putting them in, because uh, they, they mm. have uh, not only the creation aspect, but they go quite heavily into an examination of their deities and their roles. They use that as a kind of a model. Right. That's interesting view. That's interesting. They have a much more uh, realistic cosmic time period too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I think that uh, their time mm -hmm. periods are much longer yeah. And probably less disguised mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than what we deal yeah. with here. Yeah, it is embarrassing to say that the universe was created 4,004 years ago, according to some bishop in the right. early centuries. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I, I, I totally agree. But I think if I could take your suggestion and perhaps push it one more step, I don't know whether this is at all possible. It would certainly be interesting, would it not? that if we ever can reach the point where we can talk about the spiritual evolution of man, maybe there should be a canon based upon that one fact that anything that can illuminate the spiritual life of man should be included regardless of its source and brought together into a new unity. That would be really interesting. And then you'd have to have models such as you suggested from the Indian culture. Also from the, uh, the, uh, the early Persian uh, probably has some interesting facets in there too. The use of Arman, and, and, and he does. And uh, well, and uh, in our in our own areas, when you we keep you you mentioned, I, I noticed you you didn't use the term uh, other creations. You used the term well, what else in the Old Testament? You know, I, I think uh, the That's book true. of Jasher, which mm -hmm. is missing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, there have been some attempts uh, to indicate there is a book of Jasher that's floating around, but that comes from the 13th century. Mm -hmm. It was never uh, uh, authorized by the, uh, the rabbinical groups in Venice, so it's, pro it's probably a forgery. But it has some interest. If the, mm -hmm. the area that it talks about, which is more of the mosaic uh, account and flight from Egypt, but the, the things that happen there are certainly different than the Christian, considerably mm -hmm. different than that. It may be that uh, if there could be a, a unity of spiritual traditions to bring about a, a canon that would really be able to describe man's spiritual evolution and all of the works that su could support that, it would probably redefine religion. And if, even if something was written in Brooklyn, it would probably be good if it fit into the corpus and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm for it. Well, well even the, uh, the Indians, uh, the, the Mayan accounts, uh, Quetzalcoatl uh, and, and his earlier uh, accounts of, uh, and their time periods, I think, are, are of interest. I think, I think each of the mythologies in the groups have something to contribute to the total story. 
you, know, you may have to pick and choose mm -hmm. as to which ones, but in, in doing it and in putting them all together, uh, looking for the missing mm -hmm. fragments, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, each of these uh, traditions offers something that is not found in the others. Yeah. Well, if, if that could, you know, uh, all we need is, uh, and undoubtedly it, it, it could, in principle, there's nothing why it couldn't happen, as a group of people who can define that spiritual path and see what things then are most consistent with it and can exhibit it, show it. We'd even put it on a CD disc, wouldn't we? How most of the world religions have creation, myth, it's uh, have parallels to all of them. Most of them have a flood or deluge. Yeah, that's uh, true. Most of them have that's a, true. an expulsion from paradise mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the regaining of paradise. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, of parallels that already exist, which people already know of. So yes. it, it wouldn't yes. be yes. 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 a horrendous thing wouldn't to try to put yes. together. Yeah. With all our, our creative artists at work, they would have a wonderful time, wouldn't they? Right, multimedia on all dimensions, bring it all together. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We'd have to get a new kind of degree, wouldn't we? Maybe do away with them. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciated your participation. Thanks a lot.